Well, today our topic is building uh, belonging and community for volunteers. And so um, for those of you that aren't aware of Civic Champs or, or you know, haven't uh, joined a webinar of ours in the past, uh, my name is Gung Wong. Um, it's not really phonetic, it's like Gung Ho, that's easier to remember. Uh, and I'm the CEO and co-founder here at Civic Champs. Um, you can see some of my background information in terms of education and career. Uh, but in short, you know, I, I did a number of tech startups in the past, but really had a passion for the nonprofit sector. So uh, we've launched Civic Champs four years ago. Um, and our goal is to empower volunteer managers uh, so that they can better recruit, retain, and engage their volunteers uh, through our volunteer management software, right? Uh, but today, you know, our uh, we have some pretty awesome guests. Uh, so we have two speakers, actually, uh, Gabby and Emily. So uh, Emily is the uh, founder and CEO of Grapevine. Um, she brings more than 10 years of financing for impact, nonprofit, and social enterprise leadership experience at Grapevine. Uh, she was the founding executive director for NYU Center for Ballet and the Arts, um, launched the Lincoln Center at the Movies Global Media Initiative, and developed innovative financing models for impact at Enterprise Solutions to Poverty. Um, and, uh, Emily has also consulted on event cinema for Disney Theatrical Group, taught creative and cultural entrepreneurship at Sunny Purchase, and spent two years developing microfinance and fair trade programs in India. Uh, she's a board member of the Harvard Business School Women's Association. Um, and uh, previously, she was a professional ballet dancer and performed with the Pacific Northwest Ballet, among us, others. Uh, she holds a BA from Occidental College in Diplomacy, World Affairs, and Economics, and an MBA from Harvard Business School. So welcome, Emily. It's great to have you on today. Thanks so much, Gong. Yeah. Wonderful to be here. Excited to chat community with everyone. Absolutely. And then our second uh, guest or speaker today is also from Grapevine. Um, Gabby Leaf is a community builder with 10 plus years of experience working in arts and culture, tech and media industries. Uh, she's currently the community manager at Grapevine, a platform that powers giving circles. Previous to this, she worked as the community manager for Bramble, an immersive video conferencing platform for virtual gatherings, conferences, and activations. Uh, prior to this, she was the manager of the film office at the Toronto International Film Festival, and her events have been featured in multiple publications, including the New York Times. So welcome, Gabby. Super, super excited to have you here as well. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here and exciting to see another person from Toronto. That's so yeah. cool. That's right, our international cohort. <laughs> um, well, with that, I'll, I'll toss it over to Gabby and Emily um, for her, them to lead us through uh, a discussion on how we build community and uh, within our volunteer course. Oh, Emily, I think you may still be muted. Thank you. <laughs> I was just saying my thank you. So you didn't miss too much, but just wanted to thank everyone for being here. It's a great uh, group. Uh, it's always exciting to see so many people interested in community. It is what we do day in and day out at Grapevine. Uh, so it's very much a part of our daily lives. And it's wonderful to know so many other people uh, are interested in it as well. So I just wanted to quickly go through the agenda that we plan for you today. First, we just want to talk a little bit more about why community is important, and especially now. Uh, second, we want to share a framework with you for building community belonging. Okay, there are uh, some great frameworks out there, and there's one in particular that we're very fond of, and so Gabby's going to take us through that. And then we want to share four specific approaches, scalable approaches to building community. We recognize that probably a lot of us believe that community is important, that's why we're on this call, but it also can sound like a lot of work right? <laughs> it seems a little daunting, the idea of building community. I'm seeing some nodding. Um, so we want to make sure that we're giving you some ideas on how to build scalable um, community-based models. And then finally, we'll do a little discussion and Q&A at the end. So get your questions ready, make sure to have those, and, and uh, we can use the chat or whatever is comfortable at that point. So why is building community important? I'm sure many of you have seen this study and seen some of the news around it, but we are what we, we're in the middle of a loneliness epidemic, right, according to the Surgeon General. Um, one in two adult Americans suffer from loneliness and, and these feelings of social isolation, 
right? And there are many different reasons people have pointed to for why this is the case, whether it's social media having an impact, COVID having an impact, so many things. Um, but the result or the reality is that this is a challenge for all of us. And that means it's a challenge for us and our organizations and also for the communities, the people we're trying to engage. Um, the second thing that reason why community building is important is to note that donors are engaging in volunteering opportunities to participate more, to give more to those charitable organizations that they, they care about. Um, but we also know a great find is often they're, they're looking to participate more in order to give more, but also to get more, to get more connection, to get more involved, right? And so this idea of community really fits into that as well. Okay, so um, just a couple of more reasons for you to think about why community building is important, specifically in the nonprofit space. And I know this session is particularly focused on volunteering and building community with volunteers, but we're, we see that with donors as well, right? And we also know that people who donate are more likely to be volunteers. So we think of these as very much two sides of the same coin. And uh, here are just a couple of examples that we've seen recently. So when we, uh, Gabby and I, run weekly sessions on giving circles with donors, uh, we ask them, what are you most excited about? Why do you want to get involved? And what comes up over and over again is this idea of building new connections. People love the idea of amplifying their impact. They're coming together because they want to give back. But the thing that they're most excited about, right, through this model is those connections. And that includes building connections with others, with the other donors, the other volunteers, and also with those organizations. And then the second example here is one from Volunteer Match, which shows that people who are volunteering, what their motivations are, and we see there in the middle that connecting with others who care about the same cause is important, right? It is a big driver for why people join. And I've seen some other studies that show that this connection is an even bigger part of that motivation. Um, uh, set that you see here uh, when donors are or volunteers are considering um, whether or not to volunteer. So certainly building community is important when we think about just generally attracting and engaging and retaining our supporters, right? Whether they're volunteers or donors or both. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gabby to now take us through a little bit more of the how, right? And where we go from here. So Gabby, over to you. Okay, hi everybody. So I am dropping in the chat right now a word cloud. I don't know if you've seen this before, but it's a fantastic tool actually to use with your volunteers as well. Um, so take a moment and um, share what community means to you. So um, drop in one or a couple words there um, and we're gonna start to see uh, it populated here. So just take a moment there. I'm going to share. And we're going to start to see these um, words starting to take formation. So uh, this tool is really amazing because the ones that are getting the most, um, if numerous people are submitting them, they're actually going to be larger. So we can see some fantastic things here, belonging, friendship, connection, um, support, these are all bubbling to the top, I can see support, belonging, and connection. Um, so I think that's a, a, a great place to start. I'm actually going to, um, I'm going to stop sharing that and hop back into our um, presentation now, because um, we're going to talk about what community is. So I think you all did a great job of identifying this. But these are some really common ways that people think about community, shared identity and purpose, emotional connection, collaboration, friendship, neighborhood, all these different things. So um, what I'm going to talk through now is a framework that I really love for um, building community and belonging. So um, it's the seven P's of community, and it's um, sort of laid out by David Spinks, who is a sort of scholar within this space. Um, he wrote a book called The Business of Belonging, which is a fantastic book if, if anyone is interested in it. I know that myself and Emily, we both read it, um, but he does a really great job of sort of laying out these seven Ps for how you can think about community within your organization. So we have a, um, 
um, a link here that you can follow along. We'd love for you to, we're going to kind of walk through these seven Ps. And if you want to just jot down some ideas that you have, um, actually, you know what? I realized because I'm sharing, Chloe, if you're able to just share that in the chat, the link, that would be fantastic, actually. Um, but um, please do jot down as we go along. And then I'd love to have a couple of you share out um, afterwards any of the Ps that particularly resonated um, with you and what you might have written down along with it. Um, and you can just jot this down, these different sort of areas, or you can make a copy of this so you always have it, the link that's being dropped in the chat there. So the first one being purpose. So um, thinking about what your organization's mission and objectives are and how that can align with what building community really means to you. Um, and why are you doing this? What problem does it solve? What opportunities does it create? So you really need to have your clear sense of purpose um, when you're building community or else people in the community aren't really gonna know why they're there. They're not gonna have a strong sort of sense of the identity. Then the next thing is people. So this may, might not seem like a surprise, but people are at the center of this work. Um, who is in the community? And just as important, who isn't in the community? Um, what are your values as a community? Um, who, who is in there and how are they comfortable participating? What sort of technologies are they comfortable with? Or what kind of um, types of events are they comfortable with? So as I mentioned, please do jot down some things that just kind of come to your mind right away um, as we're kind of going through this. The third P being place. I actually just like really love this quote um, by Maya Angelou that the ache for home lives in all of us. And so um, Emily touched upon that really early on, this sort of um, epidemic of loneliness and that people are looking to your organizations to find that community, to find that place for themselves. So what does that look like? Are you gathering online or offline? These are really simple questions, but things to think about. Um, does this place feel you know, comfortable for people? Is it something that they feel like they a place that they want to enter into? Um, how does it inspire people? Um, and how often do you want your members to gather? I think that um, we'll touch upon it in a moment as well, but I do think this idea of ritual in community is really, really important. If you can start to establish those early, um, what is the ritual of your community? Maybe at the beginning of every event, you all share a song you're listening to. You know, what are these little things you can do that really establish place and ritual amongst people? Participation. So what are the different ways people can participate, you know? Um, if someone doesn't have access to technology or, or whatever it is, um, how can they still engage in what you're doing? Uh, what are the reoccurring experiences that people can participate in? So that really touches upon that ritual idea. Um, what do you want people to understand right away when they join um, so that they are aware of what they're entering into and if it's the right kind of fit for them? Um, and then really trying to understand beforehand what are the barriers that people might be facing to your community and asking people so you can um, figure out how to prevent them um, from the onset. Policy. This word sounds kind of intense, but it, it really isn't. This is just um, really having those guidelines in place so that if people in your community aren't following these sort of basic guidelines you've set out, you're able to say to them, hey, this is what we've established for our community. You're not really um, following that. So that's the reason why um, this we're removing you or this isn't you know the right fit for you. So thinking about these things beforehand are really important. You know, what kind of behaviors and actions do you want to encourage from people? Um, and also, how will you communicate this out to people? Uh, is it going to be, um, you know, Facebook groups? If someone joins the Facebook group and the policy pops up right away before they agree to join, is that where you're going to communicate it? Um, you, are you going to communicate it in the invitation into the um, community? Or are you going to communicate it at a volunteer gathering? Maybe you have new volunteers and you want to talk about that right at the beginning of your event. So just thinking about these ways and um, how you think your members um, and your volunteers will be most receptive. Then the idea of promotion. So a community 
um, is not much good if there's nobody in it, right? So um, how do people discover your community? Um, how do you motivate people to invite others in? This is something we're always thinking about at Grapevine. How do we encourage our um, Giving Circle members and leaders to be excited and want to advocate for their group and invite people in? Um, and as I said, yeah, what do you want people to know before joining? So that also kind of touches upon the policy piece. And then performance, how are you gonna measure how successful um, your community is and where you need to improve or where you need to celebrate out what you're doing? Um, so these are three kind of areas that you can really look at to help evaluate this. So content. Um, are the, is it effective how you're communicating out and the types of materials out there? Um, participation, are your members engaged? Are they having a good um, experience? Don't be afraid to check in and, and ask your volunteers. You know, um, Often at our, our office hours that Emily and I run, we'll just share out a really quick Zoom poll and say, did you get out of this what you want? Yes, no. And so you can really easily um, get that feedback. Objective, are you achieving your organization's goals? You know, is this helping or is this not helping and adding more work and you're not really getting anywhere? So before we actually get, get into the next section, does anyone wanna share out? I'd love to hear a couple um, things that anyone wrote under a P. Pause it. Yeah, and if you don't want to come off mute, you know, feel free to put it in chat as well, right? If uh, there's anything, yep. Annual survey from Veronica. Awesome, great. Do an annual survey, fantastic, wonderful. And okay. Veronica, I'm curious, what do you do with the the annual survey? With what you hear? Any examples you can share of how that's been helpful in building community? Yeah, so we do an annual survey along with regular volunteer meetings. So quarterly, we'll do a training. Um, so at the with the survey, we have a board of made up of volunteers, like a board a volunteer that participates in one of each of our programs, and then we bring them the results and we discuss it amongst this board of volunteers. So it's not the board of our agency, just internal volunteers. Um, mm -hmm. And then from there, we determine if we actually need to make changes, why it's not so many people filled out the survey, if this is actually a problem or it's just like an issue with one or two people and go from there to make changes. And we actually send out an email after this meeting, letting, know, letting the volunteers know what our action plan is. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it's great that you're so methodical about that. You know, you have all these steps in place to really utilize that information once you get it. Um, I think that that, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I can also see Beth has written here quarterly Zoom meetings for volunteers. Love this. We're going to talk about that a little in a moment as well. But that's really that that ritual, you know, people know to expect it. It's part of sort of being a volunteer. Um, how do people discover us? Uh, this is from Sarah. The Olympic Discovery Trail. How can people invite others? Cool. Okay. So, um, Sarah, do you want to share any more about that? Curious to hear a little bit more. Yes. Um, I think I just unmuted myself. Well, I yeah. just started working with the Olympic Discovery Trail, which um, is on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington. I'm their volunteer coordinator. And, um, you know, we have all of these we're the largest rail to trails in the state of Washington and it runs from Port Townsend all the way to the coast. And it's about to become Puget Sound to Pacific. And so there'll be some added um, trail components and they just need to um, utilize, um, you know, all of their, they have all these bulletin boards at every single trailhead and one side of the bulletin board is always blank. And uh, it just drives me crazy because I feel like this is where, you know, they should be sharing how can you get involved and how can you become a part of this? Because especially in areas where it seems like there are a lot of retirees here where we just recently moved to and people are looking for things to do. And the way that, um, 
you know, I've started kind of formalizing, here's how you can sign up. And they're very low barriers to entry and just really making it easy for people um, to discover how they can help with the trail system, whether it's supporting a, an event, you know, a running event or a cycling event or mm -hmm. a trail cleanup um, th that will help them feel like, hey, I see a piece of trash. I'm going to pick that up because I have ownership here and I'm going to invite my friends and we're going to have a whole group of, um, you know, folks who want to meet on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. and walk the trail and bring a bag and pick trail trash up or something like that. So. Awesome. Well, thank you for sh sharing, Sarah. And um, I love this. Yeah, you're you're really talking about what the, you know, this this nice entry point where people could have this visual of this empty bulletin board that there's so much opportunity for community. So um, I, I think that's a, a great thought that you've got there. Um, all right, we're going to jump into, we've talked about community, the framework, it might feel a little theoretical. Hopefully you wrote stuff down so you have some really clear um, notes to take away from this. But now we're going to jump into some scalable approaches that we do at Grapevine to really um, give you some ideas of how we put this into motion with our, our community. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about here is our peer learning cohort. So this is something that we do for our leaders who are leading giving circles. Um, we put them into uh, different cohorts to learn from one another, ask questions, share learnings, all that kind of stuff. And we batch it by the date that they joined, essentially. Uh, we do that so that people are starting um, the questions are sort of um, at the same point, um, because we find that that's the most helpful for people. Um, and it's a private space. You have to be um, receiving an invitation from us to join um, so that it is really, we're really thoughtful about who is in there. Um, and then we also outline the rules um, of the of the cohort up front, just so people, you know, back to that sort of policy and how you're communicating it out, we do it right on the page. And I'll show you that in a moment. Um, and then these are just a couple tools you can use if, if maybe this is resonating with you, connecting maybe different volunteers who join at a different point. Um, you can use a Facebook group, super simple, LinkedIn, a WhatsApp group. There's also some um, tools, Mighty Networks and Circle. These are paid platforms, but if um, you really want that localized space with a forum, all these different things, those are great tools to, to look into. And this is um, this is what our, our cohort looks like. You can see these different colors here, our, our, our policy, but we host it on the Grapevine platform, um, but it operates in a very similar way that a Facebook group would, for example. Um, and then this here, I've just pulled out our, um, our rules of engagement for the group. So we outline in green there on the left-hand side, what the group is for, trying to make it super clear and what the group is not for, just so people have a really clear understanding of how to bring themselves to that particular space. And then um, just called out, I actually think Jessica might even be on this call. I see, I pulled out a quote from you, Jessica, um, if you are, but um, this is, you know, one of the purposes of this is to have people ask questions and have others answer for you, which is a really amazing function of community where um, people are just excited about their knowledge that they are um, answering questions for you, you know, and bringing their own kind of spin on it. So I'm um, just kind of a question here, which is why I pulled it out. Um, but this just gives you a little insight into how we run our peer learning cohorts. Um, and then, Tom, I believe you are going to chat for a moment. Yes, sorry. <laughs> I was trying to, it's been so long I uh, uh, with Zoom, but I still can't find the unmute button half the time. <laughs> um, yeah, so absolutely. So I think, you know, with peer learning cohorts, right, when it comes to volunteering, um, you know, I, I would say a couple things. So first is, um, there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of people, you know, right? They they volunteer because of these like social experience, right? And they're trying to find connection, and so whether that's making a new friends in new cities, right, or or finding community post retirement, or you know connecting with like minded uh, uh, 
uh, people, right? Uh, learning cohorts, I think, can create this sense of camaraderie and shared experience, especially as everyone typically is in the same tenure, right? And so if you think about, uh, you know, like you said, you know, like schools, et cetera, right? The, you know, a lot of these really powerful uh, community moments, right, are, are where you have this learning cohort. Um, I think it also, if you have a learning cohort for volunteers, it can really re increase retention as well. Uh, to form more uh, meaningful and deeper relationships with that cohort. Um, you know, again, you know, thinking of all the, my personal experiences where I've had lasting bonds, uh, many were with a cohort where uh, we grew up together, right? Whether that is, you know, in school, whether that is, you know, in a, in a dorm or something like that, right? Um, and then I, I think, uh, you know, in terms of very specific examples, Right. Um, you can also think about uh, volunteer training programs, right, for like docents, uh, dog walkers, or master gardeners, where, you know, maybe these learning cohorts could be a really, uh, you know, a, a different way to frame uh, those type of training curriculum that you people have. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, you know, some of our thoughts. Certainly, I'm, I'm sure there, you know, if others have other uh, interesting, you know, uh, snippets on, on how this might apply to volunteers. I mean, you'll feel free to put that in chat as well. Awesome. Thanks, Gum. Um, the second thing I'm going to talk about here is um, mentoring and one-on-one -on -one matching program. So we have sort of two ways we do this. One, actually in the Grapevine platform, people are able to sign up to be matched for a one-on-one -on -one conversation with another member in their giving circle or just in our community in general. We've got that built into our tool, but you could have people fill out a Google form and match them that way. There's so many ways you can do it. It's a very simple act, but it is a very powerful way for people to feel really connected to someone right away and also to what you're doing. Um, and we've we've found people start giving circles just because they randomly met someone from the match. So it can be really, really powerful. We also um, run a mentorship program for our leaders and we ask them to fill in um, a survey so we can match them with someone. Uh, we try and make it really, really low um, uh, commitment, time commitment for them. The expectation really is one, one hour conversation with someone else. And then if it goes well and they want to continue that, fantastic. Um, and we also provide a really clear agenda for that conversation to help guide them. So um, it's linked there. If it resonates, you can, you know, make a copy of that for sure. Um, and some tools you can use for this, we just match people via email for our mentorship program or our coffee chats via Grapevine. But there's some more paid tools you can explore as well. Two I've um, hauled out here are Meet, See, and Orbit. Um, but if you want to invest in something like that, those are, are great tools actually for that. Um, all right, I'm going to pause and I'm going to um, hand it up back over to you, Emily. Okay, great. And I will just add on this mentor one on one programs piece that we get incredible feedback from people who do this it's kind of the best way to build community because you're actually letting your community members do the connecting themselves, right? You don't have to be um, doing the work. Uh, it's just, you put them in touch and they are, they're, you know, like-minded in some capacity because they're both in your community for, for some reason and they just, magic happens. Um, so I will say this is just, has been a really interesting experiment for us. Honestly, we started this, I think, Gabby, at the end of last year, maybe as an experiment. And we were just doing the matching ourselves. And it worked so well uh, that we did end up building it in, into the platform. But it is just really fun to see the feedback and how much people just love that opportunity to connect one on one uh, with each other. So really nice model there. Okay, so I'm going to talk for a minute about member mixers. And this is something that we've been doing at Grapevine for a little bit. And actually, Gung, before I talk about this, though, did you want to talk about anything related to one-to-one -one matching and mentorship in the volunteer space? I apologize. I think I may have No, no. no. Um, yeah, I think my only thought there could be that, um, again, kind of tying it back to your training programs, uh, mm -hmm. one thing we've seen some really successful nonprofits do is have experienced volunteers train mm -hmm. new volunteers. And in many ways, again, sort of a little bit of a reframing, but you can think of those as really like mentorship uh, experiences, right? And uh, it does, a, you know, there's a lot of benefits. One, it reinforces 
things uh, for your experienced volunteers, right? Like if you think about the uh, the learning journey, right? Right, like you you see someone do it, you do it yourself, and then you teach somebody. And so this is that teaching component. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it also really helps establish norms for new volunteers uh, to see and hear from it, not just from the staff, but really have it sort of uh, brought to life for them uh, with with you know more experienced volunteers. Yeah. That's great. I love that idea. Getting that's another level. Connecting them one to one is one thing, but then actually getting them to mentor, as Gabby said, and then fully train uh, is is fantastic. Very very scalable approach to community building. Uh, a third idea we wanted to share with you, where we've seen a lot of success, and and would be curious again, as Gong said, if you have similar experiences or others to share, please do let us know in the chat. But we started these member mixers. A while back. And the, the reason really was we were doing these events where we had content and we're sharing information and asking people to share in the chat uh, to let us know where they were joining from. Not actually not unlike this call. And we were finding so much uh, connection happening in the chat and people really loving that part. So we started building out little side uh, connection moments where we could put people in smaller groups. And we just realized there was such a desire for that, that we were going to try Uh, uh, events specifically for just connecting. And especially for new members, we have a lot of people joining who are new, you know, so we're always kind of trying to figure out how to pull new people in and connect them with people who have been around for a while. And uh, these member mixers have been just so fun and um, so successful. So we do these monthly Zoom calls and we have people across the country. So many of you might be organizations with communities that are across many spaces, right? And so it's wonderful to have those in-person connections, but it can also be really fun to try and pull people together virtually across locations. And for us, uh, we, the way we've structured these is to have it just be an hour. So it's a very set period of time. We do have those breakout rooms, like I mentioned. So it's not the one-to-one connecting, but it's the small group connecting. So you still get to feel like you're in a small group and everyone gets a chance to share. We give them some fun prompts and we usually try to keep the, the small groups to uh, a shorter period of time, maybe five or six minutes, sometimes a little bit longer, and then mix it up. So they get experiences to be in a couple few small group experiences throughout the the total session. And then we do have this ritual uh, of a raffle. As Gabby was saying earlier, the ritual is really fun. People come to uh, expect it. You know, we do drum rolls and people play music and it just starts to take on a little bit of a fun atmosphere um, when we add that in. And this is a, a donation raffle that we do because that's relevant to our work. But it could also just be a great way to tie in some of the work that you do, right, to feature something in that raffle or or feature uh, someone, right? The nice thing about this is that when someone wins the raffle, then you get to have them speak. And what a fun opportunity for many of them to say why they're in this community and why they're excited about this donation what it's going to help them do with their giving circle. You know, that again is our situation, but it is just a nice way to be able to shine the light on a community member and give them a chance to to take the floor. So lots of good tools out there. As I mentioned, we use Zoom, but obviously Google Meet's another one. Gather is one I'm not as familiar with, but um, Gabby, I'm not sure if you want to share anything specific about that tool, but that seems like. Yeah, it's just um, you get little sort of icons you can move around it's very much part of this um, Mm. sound getting to break out of this sort of zoom box um so if you really feel like you want people to be able to have a a bit of a unique experience it might be worth looking into that great yeah so many fun new ways to connect virtually since since COVID and so many fun new developments there okay gong yeah I'd love to hear from you on how you see this being leveraged in the volunteer space Sure. I mean, a lot of folks, obviously, you have your uh, appreciation lunches uh, for volunteers. Oftentimes, you know, you can think about it as, as as very similar, right? You could also, I think, to Emily and Gabby's point, right, with virtual, um, you can you can do something more, more maybe lightweight on a more regular cadence uh, to, to connect your volunteers with each other. Um, or even instead of thinking about a... Um, an actual, you know, luncheon or something, you can keep it a little bit lighter weight in terms of donuts and coffee, right, at a coffee shop that you're just connecting with. Um, I think having something like the raffle that Emily mentioned, uh, or like icebreakers can be a really good way to um, allow people to get comfortable connecting with each other, right? Um, You can even also think about, um, 
you know, one of the things I love about Grapevine is this ability to do polls and things like that, right, where you have input into your community. And so I think for volunteers, that's very similar, right? You could think about, hey, you know, do we do we want some feedback, right, from our volunteers? Could that be part of that experience in terms of when we have this member mixer as well? Mm. So um, those are, yeah, those I think are some of the uh, ways that we think about it. Um, mm. And then the other thing that we, you know, I wanted to do real quickly is, you know, think about um, we're a technology company, and so <laughs> how can technology help you uh, with this? And so obviously, you know, I'm uh, most familiar with Civic Champs, right? And so uh, for those of you that haven't seen our platform before, uh, this is sort of the backend admin uh, dashboard. And what I have here is just your uh, calendar of events for folks. And so if you think about a member mixer. Right, you could use something like Civic Champs. You can use Eventbrite. There's a number of other platforms, um, right? But you can create an event. You know, here's a 12 p.m. member mixer um, that you can click into here that I made. And so, creating an event, uh, you know, is pretty simple. You can put in, you know, the description of the event, when it is, does it recur? Um, you can, you know, put in, you know, the the event highlights, and then who your point of contact is, right? Like if they had questions, who is it that they might want to reach out to? Um, our day of instructions, you know, this is an automated uh, reminder for folks 24 hours ahead of time that they'll receive. Um, and then you could say, hey, for my participants, um, you can create groups within something like Civic Champs, right? You could say, hey, this is just for my volunteers, right? My approved volunteers. Um, maybe I have other events that's for a broader audience. So you can kind of start to think about what kind of uh, uh, event you want or, you know, which sub, uh, subset of, of, of your community you're, you're inviting here. Um, location's pretty straightforward, right? You know, where are you hosting this event? Um, the yellow circle, uh, that's how we use that for geofencing. So if you're doing uh, check-ins, uh, if you walk into the yellow uh, on your mobile, it might ask you or prompt you to check in. Um, and then here you can have, right, you can have, you know, how many slots are available to, so you don't get over inundated with folks, right? If you're at a coffee shop, you may not be able to support 30 people. Um, you may have volunteers at your volunteer mixer, right? You might actually need some folks to help you be greeters, uh, maybe ushers, things like that. Um, and then there's some other uh, features here like waivers that you could use if you need to. Uh, photo release would be a good one. Always good to have that on hand so that if you're taking photos, uh, people are able to, to leverage that. Um, and then, yeah, for a volunteer, right, they can easily sign up for events, right? So you can see a description, they can see how many slots are available, and then they can hit this register button, right? And so that's, that's kind of an easy way, uh, you know, to use technology. Um, I think the other thing I wanted to share real quickly here is, you know, perhaps if you're on the run, since we are a tech company, uh, one of the more interesting things I think is also just, could you do this on your phone, right? Everyone's on their phone uh, these days. And so what does this look like if you're on mobile? And so hopefully people can see my screen here. Um, and then, so yeah, so on Civic Champs, right? So there's a couple of things you could do on the mobile side as well. You could do the same thing where, you know, you go in and you can register for, um, the event, right? So this member mixer, if you look at it, it says, you know, it's good. Um, you can say I'm, I'm available. I want to be a volunteer. Um, and then agree to your photo release waiver, right? And now you're signed in um, and your person as your contact receives also a, a notification that uh, you've signed up, which is great. And then on the off chance, right? If you are actually tracking, you know, attendance, uh, people can easily, you know, one tap, two tap, sort of check into the event. Uh, to say like, hey, you know, I did attend this event. Uh, maybe you count it towards their volunteer hours. It's sort of up to you how you want to do that. Um, and then one of the other really fun things is to have a healthy community, right? You want to sort of make sure that people actually had a good experience the time. And so allowing folks to have this ability to say, hey, did I actually enjoy or have a fun time? Or you can ask them, say, hey, do you have any recommendations for next time? Like maybe I don't like coffee. Let's do, let's do tea next time, right? Or something like that, right? Um, and they could say that's, that's their feedback. So anyway, I wanted to share that real quickly, just give people a quick highlight of maybe how technology could be helpful here. Um, but yeah, let me turn it back over to uh, to Emily and Gabby. Great. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it back over. And one thing that I, I really loved seeing all of that, and it just made me think too, that in addition to organizing member mixers yourselves, uh, 
you can also encourage members to organize their own mixers, right? That's one thing that we've been doing is we've been thinking about how do we scale communities? We have a thousand active communities now across the country and we can't be there to, to organize all the mixers in person, right? We organize those national ones, but we've been thinking about how do we get other people in the groups to feel like they can take on that ownership and, and schedule, or organize a mixer. And maybe it's something as simple as Gung was saying, just a, a coffee, right? You wanna keep it really simple and easy for them. Um, but that's been a really helpful tool for us in um, just helping more people to get connected, feel connected. Uh, okay, so the last thing that I wanted to note, because uh, we are a platform for giving circles here at Grapevine, so I would be uh, remiss if I did not share starting a giving circle as an option for community building. Uh, the way that we think about giving circles for nonprofits is that there are really two main ways that you can consider a giving circle. And, and really, a giving circle is a community of people who come together to pool their donations and collaborate to give back as a group. Right. And so some people actually think of these as uh, these people who are participating and helping to decide where funding goes and organizing the gatherings. That is in itself a kind of volunteer activity. Right. The volunteer is helping to organize the event. Um, but it also includes a clear donation element, right? So there's kind of an interesting overlap here with this model. And when we think about nonprofits getting involved, the first is you can create a community of recurring donors to your own organization through this model, right? So essentially you can set up a giving circle for your nonprofit. And in this way, you can uh, invite donors in to be a part of this community. You can and, uh, invite those donors to share it with others who might want to be a part of this community and do a lot of the same community building things we've been talking about, right? Helping these people to connect with each other, to, to share, to collaborate. Um, and often that does include then deciding where their donations go. So part of the giving circle model is to raise more money or to, to raise money as a community, and that can result in more funding for your organization. There's also often an opportunity to let the members of the giving circle help decide where their pooled fund goes. So it's a really nice way for them to feel really connected and engaged with your work, understand it better, and um, help decide what is important to them as a group and ultimately um, direct those funds aligned with that. And then the other thing I like to note about giving circles is that we've seen this model really work well to attract new donors. So I'm often hearing from nonprofits that they're, they're looking to grow their donor base, of course, or retain their donor base. So this is a great model for that. But they're also often looking to try and expand the types of donors that they're engaging, right? So maybe you're trying to engage more women donors. Maybe you're trying to engage more next-gen donors. Those are often segments that I hear. Um, and it turns out this community-based model is a really nice way to give people that sense of connection and belonging within your organization. Gabby talked about that a little bit earlier, right? Giving people a space that feels safe and relevant and um, where they feel a sense of belonging. And so when you have a giving circle that um, welcomes them into a community that they feel connected to, uh, that can be a really great way to help build uh, more of a donor base that is next gen or that is women or whatever it might be that you're trying to expand into and give them um, more of a space to, to welcome them. The other thing that I like to note for giving circles, or excuse me, for nonprofits, is that you can also participate in the broader giving circle movement by joining an existing giving circle, right? So on Grapevine, for example, we have a thousand active giving circles. We have more than 60,000 members in these groups that are in every state now across the country. And uh, you can go onto the platform and find a giving circle near you, right? Maybe it's Reno Women for Good or Cleveland Women in Business for Good or the Oakland Community Alliance. Um, whatever it is, you can find one that's related to a particular area or a particular cause that's relevant to your work and join that group participate in that community, right? And so by being a participant, that is the best way we found for people to then be able to share more about their work and their organization, and ultimately um, potentially get a larger grant from that giving circle uh, by nominating their organization for the group to consider. Uh, but even if that doesn't come to fruition, uh, this is an incredible community of people who care about a similar community or cause that, that your work is focused on. And so out of that, you can connect with really great advocates 
uh, our future advocates and donors, volunteers. We see uh, new board members being um, recruited out of these giving circles. So just a really nice community to be a part of when you're thinking about sharing your mission more broadly and um, bringing more people uh, along with you. So the last thing that I'll note, and then I'll turn it back to you, Gung, is just a few helpful resources. And we'll drop these in, in the chat for you as well. But uh, if any of you are thinking about starting a giving circle or connecting with this broader movement, uh, here are some resources that we've put together to help you do that, to either find a giving circle that you might want to join or share with your broader community uh, to ask them to join in order to be an advocate for you in that space, or how you can start a giving circle for your nonprofit. And we're actually working on some strategy sessions uh, for nonprofits and how they can build their own giving circle strategy. So if that's interesting to you, uh, we do have a wait list for that. And you can sign up for that there as well. Okay, happy to share more in the chat or in the, excuse me, the follow-up Q&A, but uh, we'll turn it back to you from now, Gung. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that's sort of the the wrap of our sort of formal presentation. We'll have a few more free giveaways and, and sort of tidbits here coming up, but in case you're interested in connecting with either uh, Emily and Gabby or I, right, this is our contact information. Uh, again, we're going to share all the slides and information um, with you all uh, here in a follow-up email as well, so um, you'll get that. It's also here in the chat for those of you that are looking for that. Um, we also uh, have an ebook on unlocking the power of volunteers, and so there's a QR code um, if you're, you know, if you're interested in, in just, you know, getting a refresher on maybe some best practices. Um, a lot of you are already experts here, of course, right? Uh, but this might give you some uh, food for thought. And then um, in terms of us, right, of course, right, just uh, we have uh, end of year promotion for Civic Champs. Um, it expires uh, here at the end of the year. But basically, um, if you start with us uh, now, uh, we'll allow folks to sort of get free usage of our platform until the new year. Um, and all contracts start on January 1. Uh, so that's that's kind of our end of year promotion that we're running. And then uh, we have one more webinar for this uh, 2023 season. We're gonna skip December, take a little bit of a break, come back in January. So uh, be on the lookout for that. But our last webinar is gonna be on the 30th um, at 10 a.m. Pacific or 1 p.m. Eastern. And it's AI for beginners. It's easier to use than you think with our friends from Momentum, uh, which is a fantastic um, sort of AI powered nonprofit tech company here. Uh, but they're not going to talk about just them. They're going to talk about all the different AI tools that are out there, show you how truly easy it is uh, to use so that you can use it on your day to day. Um, I use ChatGPT, for example, every day uh, now. I, I love it. It does so much for me that it would take uh, forever. Uh, but I'll let them talk about um, that here on the 30th. And with that, yeah, we'd love to take any questions from folks. If there's any, uh, feel free to put those in chat. Um, oh, I did see one. There's actually one question from Melanie, which is, what is the ideal size for a giving circle? Hmm. That's a great question, Melanie. Um, you know, we have we see giving circles all sizes, small groups of family and friends, right? Just a handful of people that aren't looking to grow as a group, but just really to deepen their existing connections together to much larger groups with thousands of people that are national in scope or beyond um, focusing on broader causes and issues. I would say that the typical one where we see most giving circles land is somewhere between 50 and 100 members. And these are groups where it's kind of a, you know, a combination where it's location specific often or cause specific. So there's some kind of focus for the, the donation, some alignment around, hey, we want to give to support this area, Reno, Nevada, for example, or we want to give to support this cause, Healthy Oceans, for example. And... Uh, and then some, some additional alignment with who's in the group. So are we a group of women? Are we a group of founders? Are we a group of marketers? Uh, it Those kind of overlaps we found to be particularly strong when we're putting together groups of people who want to give back. And so depending upon uh, those overlaps, again, it's usually 50 to 100 people where we see these groups really thriving. Uh, but like I said, we, they're all different sizes and it really just does depend on the group and 
you know, the goals and the community that aligns uh, around it. Awesome. And then I saw another question from uh, Sharonda uh, asking, uh, how do I know if someone has a program or uh, was looking for training sessions for volunteers and asked if there was a template for that? So um, I think what I would encourage, right, so we have the ebook. And so there's a section on training in there. Uh, but let me also put one other sort of blog post that we have. Uh, this is around creating, it's not exactly it, but it's creating an effective volunteer handbook. Um, one of the first things you want to do as you're thinking about a training program, right, is, you know, from a policy standpoint, um, you know, have, have uh, elements in your handbook, but also it helps set expectations for your volunteers, which are all the elements that you really want to have uh, as you're thinking about training, right? And so hopefully that can be a helpful uh, tool to get started. Yeah, absolutely. And feel free to reach out for, you know, sometimes uh, the other thought I had is that uh, a little bit, it's it's uh, dependent on the context of what kind of program you're running. And so uh, feel free to reach out if you're part of an animal shelter, maybe we can connect you with one of our animal shelter friends. And, you know, I'm sure they'll have a much more nuanced and specific training program perhaps that they can share. So, all right, folks. Any other last minute questions? I think otherwise, you know, I just want to give a quick shout out again to Gabby and Emily. Um, thank you both for, for joining us today. Uh, I thought this was an absolutely fantastic uh, presentation you all gave um, around how we can build community uh, for volunteers and, and just more broadly for our, uh, you know, our nonprofit communities in general, so. Great. Well, thank you so much for having us, Gong, and thanks all for being here. As I said earlier, we always love to talk community, right, Gabby? <laughs> we do it every day. Yeah, thank you so much for listening. <laughs> yeah, you guys are the pros. So, all right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thanks, all. Bye. Thanks Have again. a good one.